Hello everyone. Good morning everybody. I hope everyone is doing good. I hope everyone is having a great and a fantastic Sunday. I hope everyone got the opportunity to, you know, go to church, whether online or in person. If you didn't get the opportunity to go in person, um, God is good. We're here today. We're alive. We're well. It's another opportunity to be a better human being, another opportunity to give back, to do good, another opportunity to um, put God above everybody and everything else. It's another opportunity to, if we have not trusted God, you know, part and parcel of why many persons have not been really obedient to God is that they don't trust God. In the back of some of our minds, including myself, we feel that he will fail us we feel that what he has to offer will not work we feel that what he has to offer is not the best and uh, sometimes that is probably caused by human beings failing us and uh, unfortunately many of us have put our trust in human beings and because of that there's that subliminal seed that was sown and we 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 put that we connect that to God. We assume that because humans fail us, and that is what we know, our subliminal mind, which is a subconscious mind, it puts it to the conscious mind and we link it to God. And we feel that there is this symbiotic connection between not trusting human beings and because human beings fail us, we also must not trust God. We may, we may not say it directly, but our actions prove it. Hence, you find that men and women struggle to obey God's commands simply because we don't trust him. We don't have that faith that what he's telling us to do or what he's guiding us to do is the best thing for us. You know, we just do our own thing that we feel because we, man as in man and woman have failed us. So... Let us do things our way because our way is the best way. And we realize as life goes on more and more, we realize just like how that individual would have failed you because he and she, he and she both, they're humans that you realize that relying on your own intuition solely, relying on your own self solely, you find you come up in obstacles such as failures because they were devoid of God. I heard a pastor mention that you know, sometimes even you may have good wisdom, which is devoid of godly wisdom. And there are myriads of examples, you know, that we can give where that is concerned. You know, where there's something you may have an idea, it just seems good, but it is not necessarily God good. It is not necessarily godly wisdom. And unfortunately, we we depend on ourselves you know, almost like a self-efficacy, not, not only self-efficacy, but almost like a self-fulfillment prophecy. I remember when I was doing my first degree, I heard that um, that term coined when I was doing sociology. And, um, you know, this kind of hierarchy that we put ourselves on, you know, be, with the self heading the list, we realize the many pits and uh, the many potholes and the many what do I say now the many undesirable and undesired roads we end up because we end we depending on we depended solely on self not knowing that we really should depend on God even when you have an intuition and you have that feeling to do something one of the best remedies and one of the best things to do is to really consult God. God, should I do this? But there are some things, you know, that you as a pastor said you don't need to pray about that are just <laughs> you just know that it is it is it's God's will for your life in terms of for example if you don't have good health, there's no need God, should I pray you know, no, you pray that God heals you. You know, he says by your stripes, by his stripes you are healed. Although that was more coined as a as an emotional thing, but you can link it to the physical man. You know, there's so many scriptures in the Bible that speaks about healing. God says, 
you know, with God, all things are possible. So you know that that is his will for you to be in good health. He says, above all things, my, my wish for you is that you, my, my hope and my, you know, for you is that you prosper, even as your soul prospers. So you know that one of those things is of God. You know, the prayer would be, Lord, pray for healing, and thereafter you thank him in advance. Um, if you are poverty stricken, do you know that poverty is also not of God? Um, um, you just, you know, you declare the different scriptures while obeying, while trusting him. You know, so you don't just declare these scriptures and then you still go and do your own thing. You declare the scriptures with that full faith and trust and say, God, the enemy is making me believe that you don't want the best for me. But I'm going to, even if it's just the mere words I have to, to, to utter, I trust you. I have believed in you and I thank you in advance that I'm debt free. I thank you in advance that I'm financially wealthy. I thank you in advance that I'm a great steward of all the resources, monies and people and relationships that you would have entrusted me and entrusted in my life. I thank you. And you keep declaring that day after day. And one day, all of your declarations will just come to fruition, you know. Um, so you know that God desires for you to prosper and to have a good life and to have good health and strength and good relationships because man was not made to be alone. Um, I'm reading this book by Cecily Tyson. I would encourage everybody to get it, whether or not you want to do acting or not. It has nothing to do with being an actress, but... It's just getting that Proverbs 31 type of guidance and other from that lady. Just by reading, I'm, I'm now in chapter 2 already, you know. And um, the beginning of the book, the preface of the book started with Viola Davis giving her, you know, just giving a synopsis of how she grew up in abject poverty and how she watched her in, um what's the name of that movie again? I need to look back at it. I was just seeing it. Her first movie is something about... Uh, like she played the role of a, a significant black freedom fighter or something. Like a black woman. That was Cicely Tyson in 1974. But you know what, what, what was so funny about reading? Uh, but funny in a good way. And I want to say that to encourage us as human beings in this 21st century. Was she said... Because at that time, you know, as I said, 21st century begun... January 1, 2001. So in 1974, before I was born, <laughs> a few some years before I would have been born, um, she starred a role. But before she got that role, she was denied the role, I'm going to tell you. Be the producer and all the different persons who, you know, com will, 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 you know, the different the producers and the, the whoever, just the producers, I don't remember the other, said that, you know, she was not fitting the best fit or the best suited for the role. Why? Because she was young, beautiful, attractive, and sexy. Something like that. Yes. I remember seeing the sexy. I remember seeing the attractive and beautiful and young. So they said that the producer et al, you know, other persons that compiles, you know, the whole production of a movie and all of that, said that she was young beautiful attractive and sexy and you know at the, at, after she said that sentence the next sentence is I was 47 at the time I laughed I laughed I laughed because I said to myself in this day and age some crowd I have to say it that way when somebody hits 30 they consider them old so can you imagine 40 let alone 47 she was 47 at the time and they were insistent in finding and they could not they, there was somebody she said there was another known actress at the time who wanted much more money which they were not they were not even considering to pay you know and she even stated how much she got she said six thousand dollars and even at that time six thousand dollars wasn't good but she loved that role she knew that role was her she studied the role and she you know she was asking for the role asking for the role and they turned her down turned her down and um, she just, I guess, went home, maybe said her prayers. Because this was a godly woman, by the way, a woman of God. And um, when the, her agent called, he said to her, Cicely, and she said, yes. You know, she has this little thing about her in this feisty way, but you like it. Um, you got the role. She was quiet. He said, hello, did you hear me? Yes. And he said, how come you're not excited? And you know, you really wanted the role. She said, I knew I would, got, would have got the role. I don't know. It just seemed as if they just got wind of me 
supposing to get the room. She says, I said, a little very, you know, and I said, this lady is amazing. She said, they just got it. I knew that that role was for men. It was never for the other lady. And she said she literally would have, although $6,000 was chicken feed, she said she would have even taken $3,000. That's how much she wanted the role. And she went on to explain her different experiences, racial, you know, um, experiences, not directly, but indirectly. And that is when she said, I can't just be an actor. I have to, I'm not wired to be somebody who will go on the road and be a freedom fighter like uh, Martin Luther King Jr., you know, but I'm going to use the platform of, of this stage to bring across, you know, um, racial inequalities and getting, not just bringing it across, but getting the minds and the mindsets to change. And also, I remember her saying that, she, what she said, um, I, I'm paraphrasing that black people are known for sex and violence. So that is what we're going to give them. And that is why over the years, Many roles that you see black people played were roles where they, they look shabby, they were beaten down on, they were raped, violated against sex and drugs and the thuggy sort of a role and all of that, which gave an interpretation to many whites who said they never really considered themselves prejudiced, where in one of the movies that she came, and I'm going to tell you that movie in the other video, because remember, I'm at Job chapter 34 right now. Um, where she said, um, you know, the man, some 30-year-old man at the time when she was 47, got up on the platform and he said at a, some meeting at a function that, I, I don't consider myself prejudiced, but it was very odd hearing the black son in the movie that uh, Miss Cicely Tyson had played, that first movie, um, calling his own father daddy. So he thought it was reserved for whites only. It was reserved for white people you know, and um, when she saw the another commentator made a, this comment that when she saw the relationship between a couple in that particular movie, the black couple, that they didn't know that black people lived loving like that. And you can't even sometimes blame them because of how they have been socialized by their poor parents, you know. So um, I think that that mentality has affected the black community where in general, it, it's probably changing over time that then, you know, when you look at, when you're watching movies and you see the white families emitting love and affection, I'm talking about affectionate love now, in the gentle fashion, loving and sweet and nice and gentle, you only thought that was reserved for white people. I, I too, you know, had that belief. So when that lady made that comment, I, I didn't even take it personal because I understood it affected me. And, and maybe that is why in general, you'll find the black family, as in the husband and the mother, tend not to be as emotionally and affectionately loving to each other as you'd find probably like the white race or some other race. And slavery, obviously, you know, was a major part of that and how black the blacks have been treated. And um, aggression has been the order of the day. Aggression, aggression between each other and among each other. You know, that's sad, but I can't wait to delve, you know, get further and further into the book because I'm hoping that book will be life changing for me. Um, and I will pass on tidbits and important truths and experiences to you guys. All right, beautiful people. So, you know, I'm still in the book of Job and I found out his name. I confirmed his name. The youngster who said, you know, he listened keenly and carefully. You know, he was in the wings watching and listening to the friends tearing to shreds Job and Job making his response that he's not guilty and God is punishing him and hearts dead and the cow fat and the cow jump over the moon and the moon is coming back again. I mean, so many different comments. His name is Elihu. I could remember, but I confirmed it. I went back and looked in chapter 32 and his name is Elihu. So Elihu is still speaking because he says, you know, he's given wisdom and he's going to emit that wisdom to Sir Job. To brother Job dearest. All right, so we're going to look at and listen to what Elihu has to say. All right, mm. let's look at what Sir Elihu, in his own wisdom, has to say. We don't know if his wisdom is personal, mm. as in good wisdom versus godly wisdom. So we're going to hear Sir Elihu now. Elihu, you men are so wise, so clever. Listen now to what I'm saying. 
you know good food when you taste it, but not wise words when you hear them. So far as seemingly, um, I'm agreeing with him, that he's addressing the friends of Job. It is up to us to decide, decide the case. Job claims that he's innocent, that God refuses to give him justice. He asks, he asks, sorry, how could I lie and say I'm wrong? I'm fatally wounded, but I'm sinless. This is what he's saying, Job is saying. Have you ever seen anyone like this man, Job? He never shows respect for God. Let me read that line again. Have you ever seen anyone like this man, Job? He never shows respect for God. He likes the company of evil people and goes about with sinners. He says that it never does any good to try to follow God's will. <laughs> Listen to me, you men who understand. Will Almighty God do what is wrong? He rewards people for what they do and treats them as they deserve. Almighty God does not do evil and he's never unjust to anyone. No, I'm going to pause right here. We're going to look back at verses 7 to 9. When he says, have you ever seen anyone like this man, Job? He never shows respect for God. He likes the company of evil people and goes about with sinners. He says that he that it never does any good to try to follow God's will. You know, when I read that, it reminds me of some people who will come into the company of somebody for the first time in their lives. And they see that something seems to be happening to somebody and they're hearing how others speak. And what the enemy does, he just comes and he whispers things in their ear and they decide to speak because they feel that they know a situation or they have it. Or like his friends, maybe they heard of Job and they knew of Job. And because of the wealth that Job has had and his lovely family, a sense of jealousy and envy ruminates inside of them and permeates inside of them and they come under the guise of spirituality and they use the characteristics of God to guide their thought and it would sound like what they're saying is good wisdom but it I wouldn't even consider that good wisdom because he said he said he never this is a man that God says in chapters one and two and so on have you considered my servant Job no one is as righteous as he is when Job would have thrown his parties the Bible says he was careful to offer up sacrifices just in case his sons and daughters would have sinned against God by maybe their actions or their words. And this is what the young man who says. So he's like, he's throwing stones at the friends, but taking back the same stones and throwing it again at Job. The audacity of this young man. And then he's speaking about, oh God, that is true. God does not do evil and he never, he's not unjust to anyone, but it is not used in the right context. He also missed the mark greatly. Let's continue. Verse 13. Did God get his power from someone else? Did someone put him in charge of the world? If God took back the breath of life, then everyone living would die and turn into dust. Again, true. Now listen to me if you are wise. Are you condemning the righteous God? Do you think that he hates justice? God condemns kings and rulers when they are worthless or wicked. He does not take the sides of rulers nor favor the rich against the poor. For he created everyone. Someone may suddenly die at night. Someone may suddenly die at night. God strikes people down and they perish. He kills the mighty. Sorry, I'm skipping a little too fast. Let's go up here, people. Sorry about that. He kills the mighty with no effort at all. He watches every step we take. There is no darkness dark enough to hide a sinner from God. God does not need to set a time for us to go and be judged by him. 
He does not need an investigation to remove leaders and replace them with others because he knows what they do. He overthrows them and crushes them by night. He punishes sinners where all can see it because they have stopped following him and ignored all his commands. They forced the poor to cry out to God and he heard their calls for help. If God decided to do nothing at all, no one could criticize him. If he hid his face, we could be helpless. There would be nothing that nations could do to keep godless oppressors from ruling them. Right. Job, you have have you sorry, and he's now saying to Job, Job, have you confessed your sins to God and promised not to sin again? Have you asked God to show you your faults? And have you agreed to stop doing evil since you object to what God does? Can you expect him to do what you want 